May I have your attention, please? Worship will be starting in one minute. Please take this opportunity to prepare your hearts for worship and to be seated. And don't forget to put your cell phones on silent. to stand up and let us worship God together. We've been working our way, uh, this morning we're going to be continuing our, our studies in the book of James in a series that we've entitled Advice, Jam uh, Advice from a Brother That You Can Trust. And this is uh, part 14, Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. We'll be looking at James chapter 2 verses 12 to 13, and the advice that James will give us there. So let's get started. Last week, we unpacked James chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, and we looked at that passage through the, the lens of a story about the day that Jesus healed a man who was completely covered with leprosy. It looks like we've had some kind of power. Is that a power thing going on? Um, well, imagine that that says something about leprosy up there. Uh, the man had approached Jesus, you may remember from the story, the man had approached Jesus in the midst of the awfulness of his situation. And uh, the picture that uh, you can't see up there really doesn't do the guy justice. You may remember it from last week. If, Brian, if this is you getting back at me for what I said, I'm sorry. I, 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 I am. Um, but the, 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 you, there was, you know, in theory, there's a picture up there of a guy that's kneeling in front of Jesus. And he looks pretty normal, but uh, this guy that, that approached Jesus that day who was completely covered in leprosy, he would have been covered as well in bandages because his sores, all of his sores, were putrefying. They were not healing. And worse still, he'd been, de he'd been declared unclean by Jewish law. And because he'd been declared unclean, he's not able to live at home. Not for the rest of his life. He can't go home. Besides that, when he went out in public, he would have to cover his face, cover his mouth in particular, but he'd have to cover his face and shout, unclean, 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 repeatedly as he walked through a crowd or uh, came anywhere near people outside of the place where he was living. Everywhere he went, he would have to do that. Let me get us caught up. There's the guy there that we've been talking about. But um, he's not allowed to go to the temple either and make sacrifices. He wasn't allowed to pray there at the temple. His life had gone into complete shutdown mode. Uh, he, uh, by the time he approached Jesus uh, on that particular day, he'd lived for years, as far as we know, without ever being touched by another human being. Clean people could not touch unclean people. That was the rule. 
And uh, so without ever being touched for all these years, he made his way through the crowd hoping to get close to Jesus. And, and the crowd, of course, parted and got out of his way. And, and the leprous man then fell to his knees. And, and he said to Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And in one of the sweetest vignettes in all of the, of the New Testament, Jesus actually bent down, reached out his hand, and touched that unclean man, after all those years of not being touched, Jesus reached down and touched him and, uh, and said to him, I'm, I'm willing to make you clean. And we discussed last week how leprosy is a picture of sin because it's something that starts out small but soon consumes the whole person. Uh, leprosy and sin both make, both make a man or a woman unclean. In other words, leprosy is a picture of how sin makes a man or woman unfit to approach God. That was the whole point. Leprosy is also a picture of the way our sin separates us from God. Religion did nothing to cure leprosy because there was nothing that it could do to cure it, in fairness to religion. And in the same sense, and, in, and for the same reason, religion does not take away our sin because it cannot take away our sin. That's the issue there. Uh, we took the time last week to illustrate all this by, by drawing a line, a vertical line that I hope made sense to you last week. Uh, the line had Hitler as the worst of humanity there on the very bottom of the line, and, uh, and Jesus as the very best of humanity at the top of the line. Right there in the middle, we, we put a man we called Mr. Average, and, and we made several efforts. You may have been frustrated with me last week as we tried to figure out where to put the X that represents us, the X that, uh, on that line that would show where we are in the scale of things. And, and most of us consider ourselves to be just a little below average. We wouldn't want to say that we're better than most people, but we certainly want to say that we're better than, than some. We took on the challenge of placing our X, knowing that, the, that we'd have to put it there together based on something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3. Uh, we're all together in this, and so wherever you put your X, I have to put mine there as well. We tried putting it just below average, and we tried putting it above average. We tried putting it well below average, and then we understood from God's word, including the passage in James that we looked at last week, that no one, not one person is anywhere along that line. We all share the place at the bottom of that line with Adolf Hitler because we have so much in common with him. Adolf Hitler sinned against God and so have we. He, he fell short of God's glory and so have we. Adolf Hitler broke God's law and so have we. And anyone who's broken God's law wears the title lawbreaker. Whether that person has broken only one, and that person is not here this morning. I did invite the person who's only broken God's law one time, but they weren't able to, to make it. <laughs> no, none of us can, can make that claim. But whether we've broken God's law one time or many times, uh, it, we, we all wear the same title. And we illustrated that by, by using the, the title that some people wear, murderer, the sin of murder. When someone commits several murders, we call that person a murderer. When someone commits only one murder, we call that person a murderer. It's the same title. So after considering what Paul had to say on the subject and what James had to say on the subject, in resignation, we had to put our ex right there at the bottom, uh, right there next to Hitler, completely separated from a holy God and completely unable to help ourselves in any way. Because even if we buckled down and started keeping the law, we would not be able to keep it. We've, we already have those things that are there in the past that, uh, that keep, that where we have broken the law already. Uh, but then there came that moment in our lives when we turned to Christ just as the leper did. We knew that we were unclean. We knew that we had broken God's law. We knew that we were unable to help ourselves. We were in the same situation as that leper. And we knew that if we were going to be made clean, there was, there was only one hope, because Jesus was the only one that could do something about it. Jesus was willing. We went to him and we said, if you're willing to make me clean, if you're willing to make me clean, and in fact, Jesus was so willing to make us clean, that he died for us, he was buried, and he rose again for us. He's willing to make anyone clean who comes to him in faith, just as the leper did. We finish that up by looking at some references from God's word that helped us to understand how greatly our lives have changed by what Jesus did 
for us. Uh, we were together at the, with the rest of humanity there at the bottom of the line uh, where all of the worst of humanity had gathered together, but Jesus took our sin in his own body and died for us and then gave us his righteousness. He took our sin and he gave us his righteousness. In other words, all of the guilt of our sin, all that we owe God, was transferred to the account of the Lord Jesus as he hung there on the cross. We understood that God keeps a ledger that has a page with your name at the top. It has another page with my name at the top. But in his book that, that has my name at the top, he has entered every sin that I've ever committed, every time I've ever broken his law, every time I've fallen short of his glory. And my page was long and as ugly and as condemning as anyone's. There was another page that had your name at the top. And at the moment that you trusted Christ as your Savior, God transferred your sin to Jesus' account. In fact, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, your entire sin debt has been transferred to his account. And, and, and that's what's written in God's book on the page that contains, above the page that contains your name. Transferred to the account of the Lord Jesus, all of the debt of your sin. God then made another annotation on that same page where he wrote, transferred from the account of the Lord Jesus, all of his righteousness that makes him perfectly acceptable to a perfectly holy God. And now if you've trusted Christ as your savior, whenever God opens his book and sees your name, whenever he opens his ledger and sees your name, he sees beneath your name that all of your sin is gone and what has replaced it is all of the righteousness of Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. That's what it means when, when we say that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. It has everything to do with his accounting system. In fact, trusting Christ as your Savior produces a change in your life that is so dramatic. The scriptures describe it as moving from darkness to light, moving from death to life, moving from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God's dear Son. And Jesus described it as being born again. It's massive. So if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, your sin is forever gone. And in its place, Christ's righteousness forever belongs to you. God set us free from the debt that we owed him, that separated us from him. And this morning, G James is going to talk to us about how we should speak and act now that we're free. I mean, if somebody's really, truly free, how would you expect them to speak? What kind of things would you expect them to say? How would you expect them to treat other people? He's going to talk to us about people, how people who've experienced God's forgiveness for their sin and the infusion of Christ's righteousness into their life should live from day to day. And one very important truth that we're going to learn is that people who have been born again should be very quick to forgive others. People who have been forgiven should be very quick to forgive others. So let's start unpacking the passage for this morning. And we always do that by taking the time to stand together and read aloud together. So if you're able, please stand with me as we read aloud from James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank you. You can take your seats. We know that God blesses us with his truth whenever we read his word. The story that I want to tell you this morning comes from the Gospels, and uh, it, it happens, the entire thing happens in Matthew chapter 18, the end of Matthew chapter 18. And in that chapter, Jesus has been talking to his followers about several things. He's talked about other uh, how other people stray into sin, and uh, he's likened us to sheep along the way, uh, the, the, even the good people that follow Jesus are, are like sheep. Sheep wander away, and, and we're inclined to do exactly the same thing. But in Jesus' mind there in Matthew chapter 18, and you could look up the context for this, but in Jesus' mind, it was one thing to wander away on your own, and it was another thing altogether to lead someone else astray. That was far more serious. And that led Jesus to bring up the issue of what should happen in the church when a brother or sister sins against you. 
That's what he's going to bring up. He brought it up before the story. I want to get to the story, so I won't go into detail right now, but I can say that the followers of Jesus are about to confuse the process of restoration with the process of forgiveness. And Jesus is going to have some pretty startling things to say about the difference between those two and how he feels about them having mixed those two up. So be paying attention for that. And with that background, this is the story from God's Word from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. After Jesus finished explaining the process of restoration when a brother or sister sins against us, Peter came to Jesus with an important question. Lord, Peter said, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? How many times should I forgive them? And then Peter ventured his best guess. Up to seven times, Peter said. But Jesus answered, Peter, I, I tell you, I tell you, all of you. Jesus raised his voice at this point and spoke to everyone that, that was there. I tell all of you, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. And then Jesus told a story to illustrate what he meant. Jesus said that the, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, with the people in his kingdom. And as he began the settlement, a man was brought to him who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. And if that sounds like a lot of money, it's, yes, it's an impossible amount of money. A man was brought to him who owed 10,000 bags of gold, an absolutely impossible amount. The man made it clear that he was not able to pay off his debt, so the king ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had, had be sold to repay the debt. When the king announced that, the man who was unable to pay fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, the man begged, and I'll pay back everything that I owe. The king, seeing that he couldn't repay the debt, took pity on the man canceled the debt and set him free. But when that servant of the king left the king's presence, he found one of his fellow servants outside there in the public square. He knew that this man owed him a hundred silver coins, a much more reasonable amount of, to, to be in debt. The man who had so recently been forgiven by the king of that huge debt grabbed the man who owed this small debt and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. But this, his fellow servant, fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back, the man said. But this man, who had so recently been forgiven by the king, refused to be patient or merciful. Instead, he went off and he reported the man to the magistrate and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the entire debt. And now all of this happened in public. So when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told the king everything that had happened, everything that this other servant had done, uh, that this unmerciful servant had done. And then the master called the unmerciful servant back into the judgment hall. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt because you begged me to cancel it. In turn, should you have not then had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had for you? And then in anger, the king handed the man over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then Jesus concluded, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And that's the story from God's word. This man owed the king a vast amount of money. In fact, he owed the king so much money that there was no chance that he could ever repay it, not in several lifetimes. But it's interesting to note that the man who owed the king money was himself owed money by other people. I can imagine him looking for the people who were, who were in his debt and leaning on them in a little bit like Dog the Bounty Hunter, I guess, as he encouraged them to pay off the debt. Pay me what you owe me. And he probably stepped up his collection efforts once he heard that the king was collecting debts, was calling in his markers. In reality, 
Though even if all the people that owed him money paid all that they had owed him, he still wouldn't have come up with enough money to pay back the king. A hundred silver coins is not going to take the place of a hundred bags of gold. We don't know how long the man had carried that debt, but we do know that the day came when the junk in his life caught up with him as he stood before the king. The king demanded payment. And the man told the king quite plainly that he couldn't pay. There's no record that there was any, he was suffering from any remorse or that he was sorry about that. He just said, I can't pay you. So the king ordered that the man and his entire family be sold into slavery and that all of his goods and possessions be sold as well, his home and everything else, in order to pay off the debt. And that brought the man to his knees as he begged the king to be patient. The king's heart was moved by the change in the man's attitude and decided to cancel the man's debt and set him free. And it should remind all of us of the day when all the junk in our lives caught up with us. That happened on the day that we realized the size of this sin debt that we owe to God, what was there on the ledger. And some people faced with that reality get right in God's face and they say to God, I, I, I won't pay because I can't pay. And when they do that, they're only delaying the day until they stand before the great white throne judgment. And on that day, there will be no recourse. There will be no escape. They will have to pay the debt, their debt, with their lives. Other people fall on their knees when they're confronted with their sin debt. And, and as we talked about last week, God responds to our repentance uh, uh, by transferring all of our sin debt to Jesus and, and then follows that up by transferring the righteousness of Christ to our account. That's where understanding that exchange becomes so important. And that's why we sing the song, Jesus paid it all. Once that transaction has been settled, we're ready to go to heaven. Well, at least I, I think we're ready to go. You, you ready? Just not today, right? We're ready to go. We want to go to heaven, but we, just, we don't want to necessarily go today. Uh, because our debts have been canceled. And so we, we owe nothing more. Uh, we're, we're ready to go to heaven. But God doesn't take us straight to heaven, does he? He leaves us here on earth where we're surrounded by people who owe us a debt. <laughs> right? That's how we feel. They said or did something unkind or inappropriate and it ticked us off. Sometimes the debt that they incur is minor, and, and sometimes the things that they do or say to others, that others do or say to us, uh, stay with us our entire lives. They just won't go away. And that's where Peter's question becomes so important in the story. How many times should I allow my brother to sin against me and forgive him? What's the limit on that? And then Peter suggested perhaps seven times would be the limit. I I like that. I, I, I like the way Peter's thinking here. It gives us something tangible, right? This forgiveness thing, I don't know, it sounds kind of vague. And so Peter's trying to get a limit set on the amount of forgiveness I have to show my brother. And that would be really easy to manage. I could just keep a notebook, a little notebook in my pocket, along with a pen. And when you sin against me or tick me off, I could just write down what you did, write the number one and write down what you did. And then, and then the next time I write number two and, 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 and I forgive you each of those times. But once you get to seven, that's it. That's the limit. And if you get to eight, <laughs> God help you and there better not be a ninth wouldn't that be cool i mean if that's the way it worked that would be manageable because there are people out there that have offended me more than seven times that have ticked me off more than seven times so where do they get the right to expect my forgiveness that would be much more in keeping with human nature because those people who do the small things and, and the, those big things to us, uh, we, we all have a tendency to withhold forgiveness and hold on to our anger because we're not keeping track. We, we, at least that's what we tell ourselves. And ultimately, our lives are ruined by the torture of what that person did. Ultimately, our lives are ruined by the torture of what that person did. Oh my goodness. Somebody should be jumping to their feet right now and say, Jay, that is a totally inaccurate statement. Let me explain why I say that. We need to take a deep breath and engage with the story that Jesus just told. 
and what James has written in this passage we're unpacking this morning. Because Jesus responded to Peter's suggestion by saying, I up the ante. He insisted on forgiving 70 times, seven times, and that's 490 times if you're math challenged, and that means we're going to need a bigger notebook. We, we, we just are. We're going to have to carry several notebooks around with us if we're going to keep track of up to 490. You know what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Peter, there's no limit on this. Jesus and James are both upping the ante here, but they're doing that for our protection. That's why Jesus is doing that. Because as we'll see this morning, it's very clear that other people do not ruin our lives. Oh man, I would stand on the pulpit and say it if it would help. Other people do not ruin our lives. And it's not other people who torture us when they mistreat us. According to both Jesus and James, when we choose not to forgive, we are choosing at the same time to ruin our own lives as we carry our unforgiving spirit with us, sometimes for decades. And when we carry anger in our hearts, that anger will torture us for as long as we keep it in our hearts. We ruin our own lives when we refuse to forgive, and we torture ourselves when we refuse to let go of anger. So what does that mean? Does that mean that anybody can do anything to me and, and I have no recourse other than to just let them do it? Well, no, that's not what it means at all. But if we're ever going to understand the recourse that we actually have, we're going to have to understand the difference between forgiveness and restoration. I mentioned earlier that, that Jesus' followers seem to have confused the process of restoration with the process of forgiveness. And based on the severity and the intensity of Jesus' story, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a harsh story. But based on the severity and the intensity of Jesus' story, I'd have to say that it would be wise if we didn't confuse res restoration with forgiveness. I want you to notice in the story, I want us all to notice that the king set the man free. He set that, that guy free. He had this huge debt, impossible to pay, and the king set him free. But clearly, the king was very specific about what the man's freedom was for. He was not free to go out and collect all the debts that other people owed him. That's not what the freedom was about. He was only free to go out and forgive all the debts that other people owed him. And if he had thought even for a moment about how his life had been saved by the king's forgiveness, he could have passed the forgiveness of the king along with real joy rather than a sense of obligation. In other words, he would have found greater joy in forgiving others for the debt that they owed him than he ever would have found in collecting the debt that others owed him. But he was just too out of touch with his king. He was too out of touch with what his king had done for him to ever think about doing that for somebody else. The king assumed that he would have known that he should have forgiven others their small debts because he had been forgiven his huge debt. And Jesus told the story to illustrate how God feels and how he reacts when we, who have been forgiven, withhold forgiveness from our brothers and sisters. So if my only option is to forgive and let go of my anger, what recourse do I have when someone sins against me? Well, the answer to that question is really quite simple. I want us all to remember that, that right before Jesus told the story of the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18, he taught his followers the process of restoration when a brother or sister sins against you. But please, please understand this is not the process of forgiveness. This is the process of restoration. Let me put it up here on the screen. Nope. Let me put the process of, of forgiveness up on the screen. Um, well, wait a minute. I'm sorry. The screen, you can see, is blank. Do you know why? It's not because of them back there, and it's not because I forgot to put anything on here. That is the process of forgiveness. The screen is blank because there is no process 
for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a process. Forgiveness is the immediate response of a heart that's been forgiven. Forgiveness is the immediate response of a heart that's been forgiven. Remember the story, the man's forgiven his debt, and, and he should have immediately forgiven the debt of the man who owed him. Can you imagine how this story would have played out if that's what he had done? If he'd gone out and met that man and, just, and said to him, you know what, I've, I've been forgiven. I don't owe the king anything. So, hey, buddy, you don't owe me anything. I'm not going to hold you accountable. When someone hurts you, it's okay to be angry. In fact, we all feel angry when someone hurts us. So it's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to stay angry. We've confronted this truth before as we went through Ephesians. In fact, according to God's word, it's not okay to stay angry beyond the time when the sun sets on the day that that person hurt you. That's the time limit, the actual time limit. It's okay to be angry. But there's a time limit for anger, a, a time limit that God himself has set. Instead, when someone sins against me, I'm required by the law that has set me free to in turn set him free of the debt that he incurred when he sinned against me. Look at what James says in verse 12. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That's what happened to the unmerciful servant in the story. He'd been set free of this huge debt that, that he owed the king, but then he refused to set the man free who owed him a much smaller debt. And now this, listen, the debt we're talking about here is not money. The scripture's clear. If you owe someone money, you should pay back what you owe. Owe no man anything but to love. Pay what you owe. But think about it. We didn't owe God money, did we? I'd, I know you put something in the offering there, but you didn't do it to try to pay off some kind of debt, I hope, because it didn't work if that's what you did. We didn't owe God money. Our debt was a debt of sin that had to be paid for. And we were all set free of that, that sin debt because Jesus paid it all. We'd sinned against God in vastly unpayable ways, unrecoverable ways. And now we live in a world where people sin against us. We're, we're left here. They say and do things that hurt us and break our relationship with them. Has that happened to anybody? Somebody said something or did something to you that hurt you this past year, this past month, <laughs> this morning? Maybe something I've said has already got you a little ticked right now. I, well, I, but the truth is, what they do to us is minor compared to what we did to God, what I did to God. Still, it hurts. And I, I need to put things right, and I need to know how to do that. Well, as we've been saying, Jesus taught the process for being restored when someone has sinned against you. But let me just say this one more time. This pro I probably will say it more, but this process is not the process of forgiveness because forgiveness is not a process. Forgiveness is immediate for the heart that's been forgiven. What Jesus taught that day was how to be restored to someone who sinned against you. So let's, here's the process of restoration that Jesus taught. First, you're supposed to go to the person who sinned against you, uh, go to him or her personally, and talk alone with them about how they sinned against you. And if they admit their sin, you've gained your brother or sister. You've won them over, Jesus said. If they won't admit their sin, then you're supposed to bring one or two witnesses uh, who can attest to the fact that this brother or sister said this thing or did this thing or harmed you in some way. They sinned against you and, and that's what the harm is. And, and these witnesses can attest that they saw that because they were there when it happened. They actually saw that person take your money or they saw that person say those, heard that person say those things to you. And if they admit their sin at this point, well, you've won them over. The relationship is restored. But if they won't admit their sin, the matter must be brought to the church. And if they admit their sin, well, you've won them over again. But if they refuse to listen to the church, then they're to be asked not to fellowship with the believers again until they're willing to admit their sin. That's, that's in the New Testament. That was Jesus' teaching. Jesus is acknowledging here uh, that, that, that there, there are times when... Uh, there's a legitimate course of action that we can take. As we do this, we want to make sure that we preserve the purity of the church 
and promote the restoration of your brother or sister. Jesus is telling us that there's a legitimate action that we can take uh, that will preserve the purity of the church and, and promote the restoration of a brother or sister who sinned. Still, what Jesus is recommending there is a fairly long and involved process. And as we've already said, what Jesus had to say led to some confusion on the part of the followers because they confused forgiveness. That's, that's what prompted Peter's question. So how often, uh, you know, I got this process here in place, how often will a brother or sister sin against me and, and I still forgive him? Up to seven times. But Jesus isn't talking about the process of forgiveness. He's talking about us being restored to one another. How often? But the possibility for confusion is the very reason why we have to immediately forgive one another. Because if we haven't forgiven one another, listen to me, if I haven't forgiven you, we won't be interested in being restored to one another. That anger will linger. But if we immediately offer one another forgiveness, well then we can begin the process of restoration. We can get started. God was merciful to me when I sinned against him. And I have the opportunity to be merciful to you when you sin against me. But what if I refuse to be merciful to you? What if I, if I decide that I'm not ready to forgive you? And I, please forgive me for this. But I, over the years, you know, I've done a lot of counseling over the years and speaking into broken relationships and, and, and forgiveness is always the route that we're, you know, we take. We try to get that in place before we do anything else. I wish I had charged a dollar to every person who has said to me, I'm not ready to forgive them right now. I would be a wealthy man. This, this, is at the, this lies at the core of human nature and unwillingness to forgive. What if I just tell myself that you hurt me and, 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 and you've done nothing since that would deserve my forgiveness? What happens then? Well, if we look back at the story, we'd notice that it was the man's fellow servants who were outraged by what the unmerciful servant had done. The unmerciful servant was free to forgive, but he refused to pass along the forgiveness the king had so freely given to him. And that's when the king ordered that he be turned over to the torturers until his debt was paid. But paid to whom? What, what, what is this debt? Well, think about it. His debt to the king had already been canceled. It was done. But now he's refusing to pass along the forgiveness to someone else. The debt that that unmerciful servant owed, the debt that had to be paid, was the debt that he now owed to his fellow servant. And this is where the, the whole thing becomes intriguing to me. Think of it this way. You, you do something that harms me in some way, and because of what you've done, you owe me an apology. You're aware of that, right? You owe me an apology. Now, I can respond to that by immediately forgiving you and then beginning to work through the, the process of restoration, which might include an apology. But here's the deal. You don't have to apologize to get my forgiveness because you already have my forgiveness. But it is important that you apologize so that we can be restored to one another. It's important that I apologize to you when I've offended you. But then there's those times when, when you do something to harm me and I refuse to, re to forgive you. And as a result, I won't even consider the process of restoration. The moment I make that choice... I'm setting myself up for the torture of my own unforgiving spirit. I hold on to my anger as, uh, until the sun goes down that day, and then beyond that, uh, the next day I'm still angry, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and I'm the victim of my own unforgiving spirit. And at that point, the tables have turned. Please hear this. You at one time harmed me, and you owed me an apology, but now I've withheld forgiveness from you, and that means that you no longer owe me an apology. Instead, I owe you an apology for withholding forgiveness from you. Think about how it went down with the unmerciful servant. His fellow servants saw him being unmerciful by being unforgiving, and, and they took the matter to the king, who then judged the unmerciful servant for his ungiving and unmerciful attitude. But the king did nothing. The king did nothing to the other man who owed the unmerciful servant money. It's really quite simple. If you do something to harm me, then you're in the wrong. But if I then refuse to forgive you for what you did to harm me, I am the one who is in the wrong. And I put myself in danger of being tortured anytime I choose 
not to forgive. When I judge others without showing mercy, I'm at the same time filling out an application to be judged without mercy by others, like the fellow servants. When I refuse to forgive, I'm at the same time requesting to have my heart put in prison where I'll be tortured by the jailers. And I realize that those are strong statements, but I've grown weary, weary over the years of trying to get people to deal with this issue of forgiveness. Remember the story that Jesus told and remember how he concluded the story. He said that the king had set the man free, but that same man refused to forgive his brother. So the king remanded the man over to the custody of the jailers so that they could torture him until he would pay his brother off, uh, pay his brother the forgiveness and mercy that he owed him. And then Jesus said in Matthew 18, 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Those are some of the harshest words that Jesus ever spoke. And that makes this a dire warning. And this morning I want us to appreciate how very serious it is. We sometimes say hurt people hurt people. And I'd have to say that that's true. When someone gets hurt, they take that hurt and they compact it and they compress it deep down in their heart. And like anything else that's put under pressure, their hurt is ready at any moment to burst. And when it bursts, it explodes all over the people in their life, the people that they love. It isn't just the person who wronged me that suffers. It's everybody around me, all the people that I love. We need to realize that when we choose, when, when someone has hurt us and we choose to bundle up our anger and shove down our hurt, we're checking ourselves into the local jail and setting ourselves up to be tortured. The pressure within you begins to grow and you start striking out at others. And you don't just strike out at the one that hurt you, you strike out at anyone and everyone who pushes your buttons, including the guy in the car next to you there. I know this because, oh, I come from a long line of world-class grudge holders. I do. It's the tradition in my family. We have not been able to have a family reunion for decades now. Because this one and this one can't be in the same room without an explosion happening. They can't be in the same general area, or maybe even the same state. And all of that started with a single unforgiving spirit before I was born. I'm not even going to tell you who that was, but, well, her husband referred to her affectionately as the old battle axe. That's what he would say. It's the old battle axe home? You know, when he, anyway, just we'll leave it at that. And I, and, I, and I have to say that if you're allowing that kind of breakdown in your family, then I can tell you that your marriage, your family, generations to come are in jeopardy. You're in danger. And, and, and please know that if, that if you have an unforgiving spirit, you need to get help. You need to dig down into that. Get the help that you need. The, the typical counselor out there, if you go to, to get help, is going to tell you that you have a right to be angry. You have a right to be angry. But, but we've said this before. We just, you have the right to be angry, but you don't have the resources to stay angry. And, and we say that because anger is like a fire in the, in the depths of your soul. And if you're going to keep a fire burning, what do you have to do? How do you keep a fire burning? You throw wood on it, right? And, and, and so you take all the firewood and you throw it onto the fire and, and it burns. And pretty soon you're breaking up the furniture and, and your, your clothes, everything that you have. We burn up everything in our lives when we make the decision to, to remain angry and not forgive. And that's what we mean when we say hurt people hurt people. I've got to keep this fire burning. I've made up my mind. And if you happen to find yourself in my, in my path, then you become just another log that I'm going to throw on. I'm, well, no, I'm not sorry for that. That's the whole problem. And I'll keep throwing people onto the log of the fire of my anger, uh, onto the fire of my anger until I've burned down every relationship in my life. And then I'll continue to blame, listen, I'll continue to blame the person who first hurt me. And I'll continue to say that that person is the person who destroyed my life and my family. But Jesus would disagree. Jesus would say that it was your refusal to forgive that destroyed your family. Jesus would say that it was your decision to keep the fire of anger burning that destroyed your family. And I hope that I haven't made you angry. But if I have, please take some time to meditate on that story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18. Clearly, that's what was behind it. Remember that James has been talking about 
uh, us having been set free. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then, uh, then you've been set free. You've, you've been forgiven for everything. And if I decide for whatever reason that, that you've done something to me that I won't forgive, uh, then, uh, that I'm not ready to forgive you, that, that I, 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 I need us to remember that God's forgiven all my sin, but I've chosen not to forgive you for what you did to me. And the moment that I made that decision, I, I boarded my unforgiving spirit. In fact, I brought some candy this morning. And no, I'm not giving any to you. But I'm going to ask Brett and Angie if they'd come up here because they're going, to, they're going to help me with something. They're going to help me illustrate what we've been trying to talk about. This, uh, this is not actually candy. This is God's blessing and God's forgiveness. And uh, Angie, uh, for reasons that you might understand, is actually going to represent God this morning. And so here she is with all her all her blessing and all her forgiveness. And this guy over here, we're not sure that he deserves it, but, but she's just going to keep reaching out her hand and, and handing him blessings and forgiveness. And, and uh, as, you know, as, as he continues to grow in his faith, you're, you're feeling the love, aren't you? Aren't you? He's, he's just feeling the love, all the blessings, all the forgiveness. It's flowing in that direction. And, and now, I don't know if you realize it, but this guy's a jerk. He he is. He said something to me that I don't even want to repeat up here. And, and, uh, and he, he was sorry later, but I'm telling you what, I, I'm not ready to forgive him yet, okay? So I'm, I'm just, I am not ready to forgive him yet, and so I'm just going to, I'm just going to get in his face. I'm going to, oh, you see what's happening back here? You see what's happening back there? I have stepped between the free flow of God's forgiveness in his life. I've stepped between them. And while God wants him to feel his forgiveness and blessing in his life, I've gotten in the way. And the, because I'm in the way, God, forgive me for that, <laughs> is not going to take issue with Brett for that awful thing that he said. God is going to take issue with me for refusing to forgive him. And if he has to forcefully move me out of the way, he'll, he'll, <laughs> he'll do that. <laughs> She'll do that. I, I don't know. We're trying to be, you know, politically correct here. Do you understand what we're trying to say? Um, thank you. You can keep the candies. But share them with Angie. Remember the fellow servants in Jesus' story were outraged when they saw what the unmerciful servant did in getting in the face of the guy that owed so little, the guy that had offended him. And look what James says in verse 13 about those times when I refuse to forgive you because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful and mercy triumphs over judgment. God's the only one. God's not the only one who reacts to my unforgiving spirit. You do too. You've been in the room when somebody is all over somebody's case. And you know that feeling as they judge. You know that feeling as you, as you experience the anger with them. And you're pretty sure that they're not, under, they're not understanding, experiencing the free flow of God's grace and forgiveness. But I want you to see what it says there at the end. Mercy triumphs over judgment. In other words, when we don't show mercy to other people, I, I forfeit my right at that point to receive mercy from other people. But when I show you mercy, because you screwed up, what are the chances that, that at, at, you know, after you screw up, I'm going to screw up? Right? If I show you mercy and forgive you when you screw up, then, then the chances are excellent that you might show me mercy and forgive me when I screw up. You're going to be much more inclined and, and what if, what if we had that going on, not just in my relationship with you or yours with me, but in every relationship we have here? What if we were all immediately forgiving? What if we were all allowing God's mercy to flow? We'd, well, we'd have a church. We're all broken. We're all broken. But God's a specialist in taking, in taking pieces, broken pieces, and putting them together in in a beautiful mosaic. And as I stand here this morning, I see a beautiful mosaic. It doesn't mean that any of us are complete. 
doesn't mean that any of us are whole. It, we're broken. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on that one because you're probably too broken to raise your hand this morning, but we're all broken. But what if we were to offer one another forgiveness? What if when my brokenness rubs up against your brokenness, you were willing to forgive me? And I was willing to forgive you. What if we could be restored together and made that our habit? Instead of this angry attitude that we have with one another, withholding forgiveness. James has been very clear. Jesus was very clear. You have the right to be angry. But you don't have the resources to stay angry. So before the sun goes down today, if somebody has done something to offend you or hurt your feelings or just flat out tick you off, forgive them. Make the choice to forgive them. We'll talk a little bit of, again next week in the review about what forgiveness looks like. But make the decision to forgive them. And then, well, perhaps we'd be willing to work through the restoration process and we could all be one. Because, uh, you know, in the typical church, and we are certainly not the typical church, in the typical church, the people who sit over there, forgive me for singling you out again, but you are on the east wall, eastern wall, you remember? The people who sit over there are sitting over there because someone that they're ticked off at is sitting over there. <laughs> I don't know what to say about you guys here in the middle. You just, you just get guts, I guess. But if that's the case, forgive. That's what Jesus is insisting on. Don't be the unmerciful servant in the story. You've been forgiven of everything. And you are now free. James has called on us to speak and act as those, like people who know that they will be judged by the law that sets people free. Be merciful to one another. Will you stand with me in the presence? Father and our God, thank you today for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you at work in our hearts. And God, I realize that some of the stuff that I've said this morning has the potential to make people angry. God, I don't want people to think that I'm ignoring uh, the 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 hard things that have been done to people, to, to them, to... Uh, God, we know that, that you've told us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. It matters to you when people are unkind to us. But God, you are very insistent that we forgive as we've been forgiven. That forgiveness is the immediate response of a heart that has been forgiven. And so God, I pray that you would work a miracle in our midst I pray that you would break down the walls, that you would help us to forgive and to reach out to others, to be restored to them in relationship to them. God, we believe this is important for the sake of your glory. But we also believe that it's vital for our good. Help us to have hearts that are forgiving, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.